The World Seafood Congress 2015 is sponsored by Seafish. Hello and welcome to the first of three major live programmes looking at the World Seafood Congress coming to you directly from the Grimsby Institute here in the heart of Grimsby. It's an event which runs every two years and this year Grimsby has been chosen as the host venue. Joining me in the studio tonight to discuss the day's goings on we have Brian Young of the Frozen Food Federation, um, Emma Finn of the Canadian High Commission and Libby Woodhatch from Seafish. So it all started in style yesterday with um, Cleethorpe's Pier, which has recently seen huge regeneration from new investment. As the event kicked off there, we thought we'd go along to see what it's all about. tonight's event um, and along with our sponsors what we wanted to make sure is that delegates didn't just come to a hotel to a conference and leave and not experience the delights of North East Lincolnshire we wanted to give them a proper welcome and to experience what we have to offer and the pier what a fantastic venue for tonight's event. Tonight the delegates the invited guests will get a feel for what an old Victorian pier was all about about utilising it for family entertainment, for food, for drink, and indeed for business. Now joining me in the studio we have Brian, Emma and Libby and I'm going to start questions with um, Brian this evening. Hello Brian. Hi. Now tell me a little bit, I mean you're from the Frozen Food Federation, so tell me a little bit about how frozen food has developed in more recent years. Where, where has it come from? Well it started originally with Clarence Birdseye, so uh, Birdseye was a real person. He was fishing in uh, Nova Scotia about 70, 80 years ago, and he captured some fish, but, and he caught so many fish, he couldn't possibly take them all home. And he noticed that the, uh, the local, the Inuits, were freezing their fish by packing them in ice. So being an engineer, he worked out a system of freezing. So it, that was the start of the birth of the frozen food industry. It's relatively new, it's about 65 years old, and it's now worth about 5.8 billion pounds in retail and about 2.5 billion in food service. So it's a, an 8 billion pound food market. So it's not a small element <laughs> no, of the industry. No, it's not at all. At all. It, it, so, so what needs to change? I mean, obviously you're here, you know, on sort of the trade side. I mean, obviously we're talking about trade, upskilling and sustainability in this, in this event. You're here on the trade side. So what do you think needs to, what needs to change? What needs to adapt in the industry? I think the frozen food, food industry is very well developed. The biggest issue that we've got is the perception of frozen food. So during the Congress we've been talking about wonderful fish that's uh, been swimming in the same seas. We'll catch the fish and then we'll bring the fish on shore and we'll process it. The same fish from the same shore will then be sold either fresh or frozen. The fresh fish that might have been swimming with its brother or sister, that would be deemed to be better quality, even though it was exactly the same fish. The frozen fish, which then would have a longer life, and in many ways be fresher because it would be frozen within minutes of coming out of the sea, consumers would deem that to be less fresh than the fresh fish, but in truth it's not. So change in perception has been an issue that we've had in the frozen food industry for a number of years, uh, and that's the big issue for us. So what, what are the sort of exciting new developments? I mean, in terms of frozen food, everyone kind of thinks that it's, it's, it can't really change that much. But, you know, what we've seen, obviously, is the development of frozen ready meals and that kind of thing, and all these yeah. kinds of things which can happen with fish. Yeah. So what do you think is kind of new and upcoming technology? There's several things that are going on. First of all, uh, consumers st still enjoy putting a meal together, but going back to doing all of the work is quite difficult because very busy time press. Uh, so we're finding now that a lot of store cupboard items are now frozen, so you can find it easy to have peeled uh, garlic and sliced onions and mushrooms, 
that are frozen, which makes it very easy to put a meal together. But also we've seen some aspirational products. So you, you're now seeing uh, lobster and sea bass and lots of different species of fish appearing uh, within, within frozen. So it's become a bit more aspirational and it's the, the benefit of convenience has been pushed even harder just to make life even easier for consumers. Now, Emma, you're also here talking about trade, uh, mm. but you're here from a Canadian perspective. That's right. So you're from the Canadian High Commission. So, so what are they doing here in Grimsby? I mean, yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah, I know. I know. As I, and when I open my mouth, you'll realise that I'm not actually Canadian. Yes, um, I, I did notice. <laughs> East Yorkshire accent. Um, so we're here because Canada is a major producer of fish and seafood, has access to a large natural resource, um, and within Europe. Um, the UK is a very important market for Canadian fish and seafood exports. What I've been talking about today is the Canada-EU um, free trade agreement, um, which was signed um, in August of 2014 and is now being ratified through um, the EU member states and out in Canada. And what that will mean when it comes into effect in um, two years' time, so end of 2016, early 2017, is that a lot of the tariffs on fish and seafood that come from Canada into the EU will disappear. So that will um, hopefully open up new markets, new opportunities for Canadian fish and seafood and give EU consumers greater access to um, a lot of Canadian product that they might not be able to enjoy at the moment. So are there very big differences between what a Canadian consumer would be interested in and what a European consumer would be interested in? I mean, presumably there is. Um, you'd be surprised. It's not massively different. No, Canadians will eat lobster, um, Canadians will eat prawns, they will eat salmon. I was looking at the stats actually in terms of what the UK exports to Canada and what Canada exports here. And Canada is exporting salmon over to the UK and the UK is exporting salmon back to Canada. So mm. consumer tastes around the world, certainly from Canada and Europe, are not that different. We're very similar as nations between the UK and Canada. It's a very um, diverse population across Canada. So the taste on the East Coast would be different from the taste on the West Coast, but they're still looking to enjoy prawns, cod, salmon, tuna, the same species that you would find here being enjoyed in the UK. And what kind of diff what, what kind of things are you looking at towards the future? I mean, same question to Brian, really. Mm -hmm. you know, how, I mean, obviously you talked about this sort of historic agreement between, yes. um, that was signed you know, yes. in August 2014. Mm -hmm. what, what do you think that's, what kind of difference is that actually going to make? So for example, in Canada, um, a lot of people enjoy um, snow crab, that's a crab with like big, big, big long legs, uh, might be known more as a spider crab um, over here. That You don't get access to that in the EU very much because there's high tariffs on that. So once the agreement has, has come into effect, potentially there might be opportunities for snow crab to come over here. Lobster is much more affordable um, in Canada than it is here at the moment um, in, in the UK and in the EU. The tariffs can be up to 20% on certain forms of, of lobster. That tariff will eventually be phased out. So we might be able to see lobster taking centre of plate on a restaurant menu more so often than it is at the moment. So big changes being made. So what we're going to do now is we're just going to quickly have a look at a, a quick speech that was um, done today in one of the trade um, in one of the trade sessions. So it's a quick trade soundbite that we've got. We'll, we'll just have a quick look at it and then we'll um, turn to Libby and just see what she makes of it. In terms of the nation's side, in terms of the UK and certainly within Scotland, my, uh, my home country, the Eat Well Plate and many dietary goals were trying to target key aspects. We're obviously very much aware of a five a day message within the UK for increasing fruit and vegetable consumption, but we're also trying to limit our red meat consumption and that's just uh, red meat and also processed uh, meat products. So Libby, as we saw in that clip, we're talking about eating well, dietary requirements, and how it's almost changed from a sort of five fruit and veg a day and to now eating less red meat. And how can fish sort of play a role in that? Seafood's the, the ultimate protein. It's low in fat, it's convenient food. It's so quick and easy to prepare. It's also packed with vitamins and minerals. So it's, it in itself is almost like having a medicine. If you, if you have some of the oil rich fish, then it's very high in omega-3. So it just, it's, it's a no brainer effectively that we should be eating a lot more seafood. And in terms of sustainability, though, of course, there's this kind of quite awful loop, though, really. I mean, if you're encouraging people to eat more fish, surely sustainability is going to be affected by this. Sustainability has been addressed for many years. So about 10 years ago, the industry really woke up to having to address the sustainability question. So if you're a UK consumer, if you're going to any supermarket or into food service to eat a meal, then all of those companies will have really strict policies in terms of sustainability. So they will only be sourcing from stocks that are sustainable and and that's the reality we mustn't believe everything we read in the papers that there are no more 
fish left in, in the sea because the stocks that we're, we're eating are actually really well managed. So obviously you, you, you don't really subscribe to this view that you know the, fi the fish are getting younger as it were, as, as that report was a couple of years ago which said that you know the cod aren't really reaching their adult age anymore. We, we had the report with a hundred more cod, only a hundred adult cod left in, in the sea, which was unfortunately a, a scientific paper was misinterpreted and that, ah, and that was okay. later <laughs> proven. In fact, the North Sea uh, is going to go forward for MSC accreditation, so it's you know potentially sustainable. But the reality has been that we we've traditionally eaten very little cod from the North Sea. The North Sea was always traditionally haddock fishery, and most of our cod comes from the Barents Sea where the stocks have been at record levels for a number of years, the fishery is very well managed, so there's absolutely nothing to worry about in terms of what Perfect. we're eating. Thank you very much. Don't go anywhere, anyone. Um, we'll be back in a few minutes for more of today's discussions with our panel, and we'll be looking more at trade upskilling and sustainability. The World Seafood Congress 2015 is sponsored by Seafish. The World Seafood Congress 2015 is sponsored by Seafish. Welcome back to this very special live show about the World Seafood Congress coming to you live from the Grimsby Institute right in the heart of Grimsby. Now we've got a new guest just, who's just who's just walked in. You, you were doing a question and answer session I believe weren't yes, you? I was. I just finished my presentation. And so you are um, Professor Alexandra McManus of Curtin University in Australia. Um, I believe actually we're having some difficulties with your mic so actually we'll come back to you in just a moment if that's okay. Don't worry we'll, we'll get it sorted. So Libby um, tell us a little bit about we were talking during the ad break there in terms of um, sustainability and you were saying it's not just a biological concern it's also something in the supply chain. That's right so sustainability has always been seen as a sort of bio biological and environmental issue and looking at the, the fish and the stock and is the stock safe and you know can you eat it but the, the greatest area of concern now is over slavery and human rights and there have been a lot of uh, negative press about slavery within seafood supply chains so the UK is working collectively, it's a huge issue, we can only work, um, address it by working collectively. The UK is leading in, in many ways in terms of addressing the issue. We've developed a responsible fishing scheme standard that audits uh, compliance including social and ethical issues on board fishing vessels and that's being uh, rolled out globally. Uh, in the UK we have the Modern Slavery uh, Act uh, which is being imp implemented. So. Seafish has always been very much convening, but also developing some of the tools that we can start to work at addressing this issue. It's not just in the UK, it, it's everywhere, it's a global problem. And you were saying that it's not just the sea, well you said particularly the seafood industry has been sort of targeted almost quite harshly by this, so yes. it, is there any particular reason for that? Uh, because there has been a, a, a serious issue, and, and particularly in some of the supply chains that we import from in, in Southeast Asia, where the supply chain is more fragmented and it's very difficult to see what's going on there. So it, it, we have a, a responsibility to make sure that the seafood that's ending up on people's plates is uh, you know, r robust and, uh, and has integrity. So we have to address the issue at home where there have been some concerns, but also in the supply chains where we import from. Perfect. Um, Alexandra, I'm being told that now your microphone should be working, so okay. just say something for us. Hello. Uh, <laughs> that that, that should be working. So, um, so how does upskill, you're, yeah. you're here giving us the perspective from upskilling, so mm -hmm. how do, it, it's been changing things over here. What are you looking for in the overall workforce in Australia? What kind of differences do you think you can make in terms of upskilling? I think one of the areas where we have poor skills is behind the seafood counter in a supermarket. So we have, um, by law, you actually have to say if you're in a supermarket what uh, is the nutritional content of your food, what the food labellings are, etc. What kind, how you should be able to prepare foods. But we we have perhaps people who are unskilled. They might be younger. They haven't had a lot of uh, preparation or training. Uh, and so we definitely need to make a difference there. We know that people want to know how to cook fish. They're a little bit worried about it. Some people are zealots. Yes, I know how to cook everything. Other people are saying really love to eat more fish, really know it's healthy for me, not quite sure how to do that, can you help me? And so that's the type of training I think in particular that we need in our seafood industry across the world really. Does training really make that much of a difference to a workforce because it's also, it's, it's looking beyond their current jobs almost isn't it for, for people, it's also looking at the jobs that people might want to do in the future. I think training makes an enormous difference. I think that you know, we, we really have to think about that career pathway 
And if we're really serious about having trained expert people in our seafood industry that have some longevity in that career, we need to have training. We need to have training at the base level, we need to have training at university level and all the way through in between. And what are the further challenges that, as, as you see them currently sort of facing Australia's seafood industry? Uh, I think we have a, a number of them. One of them is being able to provide uh, meals that are specific to the needs of, of different groups. So I look at, for instance, I've just finished my presentation on seniors. In um, the UK, for instance, there are more people aged 60 years and over than there are under 18 years. And yet that, ga that gap in the market of foods that are specifically available to that target market um, is enormous. Um, when we're looking at seniors, we found that seniors, uh, their serve is between 80 and 100 grams. That's all they need for their protein. And yet when they want to purchase that amount, it's 200, 250, 400 grams. They don't want that. They want a portion they can purchase. They want a ready-made meal or just a portion that's 100 grams with a bit of a flavour pouch for them that's specific for their needs. So Brian, just tell me a little bit um, about the issues that you think are facing the UK industry. I mean, obviously we've just heard a little bit about what's happening in Australia. What, what do you think, and I mean, you know, Libby, you can also join in on this. What, what do you think are the issues that, are, that we're facing? Well, I guess, guess there's a number of big things going on and we've seen more change in terms of consumer behaviour and food in the last 10 years than we've seen in the previous 50 years. So we've seen the growth of the discounters, the growth of convenience, we've seen online, we've seen uh, click and collect, we've seen the big four retailers who could do nothing wrong five years can do nothing right now. So all of those things are changing. But as th the new generations come through, there's less skills, there's less cooking ability. So how the industry responds and makes um, sustainable food, nutritious food available to people where they have to do very little else to kind of finish off the meal. It's a big challenge for everyone and we're doing that at a time when the retail trade is in the biggest flux it's been in probably in generations. Okay, all of you don't go anywhere. Um, we're just gonna have a quick look now, because uh, obviously we haven't just been in this studio all day, we've been out and about, we've been looking at all kinds of things that have been taking place at the event. Um, so we're gonna go now to just have a look at what's been happening today. So we're going to start with Brian and we're going to go left to right. What have, your been, your, what have been your overall impressions in this sort of first, the first sort of formal day almost of the World Seafood Congress? Fantastic event. I think the thing that really comes home, I was ch chairing a session where Emma gave a, a very good talk, but it's just how global the whole industry is, and, but how common the issues are. So we heard from South Africa, Malawi, Canada and the EU and it, it just brings home that this is such a big world and everyone's involved in fishing. But the issues are very similar wherever you fish. So it is a truly global event, Absolutely. really. Absolutely, yeah. massively global. Um, Emma, tell us, tell us what you've made of this so far. So the sessions that I've been, been following through are about the, the consumer end of things and, and what we're looking for and how we can get more people to eat more fish um, and that perhaps the health benefits have not been at the forefront um, of the messaging um, as we could have been and I think that that's also something which can resonate back in Canada as well as as well as here so echoing what Brian's saying that the messages are very much the same no matter where you are. Libby your thoughts? I've been in the sustainability session all day and it, it, it's very similar it, it you know it's a global commodity we're dealing with and speakers are from around the world and they're all talking about the same issues I spoke about human rights the only way we can address them is with collective action and I think there's a willingness, everybody's here saying the same things, that they want to improve the situation and they're willing to work together to achieve that. Alexandra, your thoughts? Yes, I thought it was interesting. I'm, I'm, you know, it's a fantastic event and it's really, it is fantastic, as you said, to have this global fascination for the industry. But I think there's a really interesting juxtaposition between the sustainability that people presume that um, the consumer is focused on sustainability, but in, in actual fact, it may not be front of mind. It might be other issues, and I think we have to do as we do with all research, is 
think about that end user, that's the market. What do they want, what do they need and what can we provide and how do we provide it in the format they want? Mm. So obviously this is just the only day of the event, we've got mm. two more to go. What, what are you most excited to see, Alexandra, or, or has it all happened today? No, I, no, it hasn't <laughs> happened today. <laughs> I'm really excited to see the variety of presentations. I look at them and I think, we've got three sessions to choose from, apart from the, the fantastic plenaries. Which do I choose? Mm. And often there's one or two that I really want to go to, and, it, and it, it's very difficult. I think there's a plethora of, of information available, and I'm really excited to, to go to a number of sessions and see what people have got to say. Libby, we're running out of time. We're just going to go to quickly mm -hmm. to the Actually, rest again, of Again, the, the breadth of it mm -hmm. is covering a huge, you know, skills, sustainability, upskilling. It, it's covering a massive topic area. So mm -hmm. it's, it's great. There's something for everybody here. Yeah, Emma. and the way that it's been structured mm -hmm. with the different breakout sessions, you get an opportunity to meet a lot of different people. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's a lot of networking that can yes. go on, which I think is really valuable. Is, is, is networking really critical then? Is Absolutely. It, is, oh, yeah. definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Mm -hmm. You can be sat in a session with, with somebody from the trade and you can sit next to somebody else who is concerned with sustainability. And those connections can lead you on to, you know, to, to really um, worthwhile discussions. Plus, it's so people from around the world. It's much easier meeting them in Grimsby in one <laughs> room than yeah. travelling around yeah. the world yeah. to <laughs> see them all. It's yeah. been fun. You know, I've had my list. Perfect. Of global Perfect. People Thank you so on. much. Yeah. We've run out of time. Um, that's all we've got for today. Thank you so much to my amazing panel. You've been absolutely fantastic. Uh, we'll be back again tomorrow evening, live at five here on Estuary. Um, our guests will be Timothy Hansen and Chris Leftwich of the International Association of Seafood Professionals and Mike Mitchell from Young. Stay tuned for the news coming up next. Goodbye. <laughs>